What we learn in separations is that in a downcomer, you have a section of liquid, and then on top of that, you have a section of aerated liquid, and then on top of that, you have your clear vapor that then extends up into the tray above. That's how we learn about downcomers, and that's what we use in our design. Now, <clears throat> when I push play again, you'll see a lot of swirling motions, a lot of stuff coming down and stuff going up. And the point is that this whole thing, so this is the tray down, down here, this is the outlet for the downcomer. And you'll actually see a bubble come up from down here and it'll float to the top. And the point is the entire downcomer is full of aerated liquid. So what we learn in separations is, is very idealized from what actually happens. So that's the bubble right there. So, so all of this, is aerated liquid. That's another shot of the downcomer. So, so the point is that uh, um, if you want to switch that, okay. Um, what happens in what we learn in separations doesn't actually reflect reality. So there is a need to actually understand what happens inside of a distillation column because the theory that we use doesn't explain it. Um, now, lest you think that what I'm saying is that theory doesn't matter. Um, and that all of the things that we learn in school are invalid. Because so, so that's the first point, um, that in a real column you can't see inside, and then we talked about the different parts of the, the, different parts of the video, how um, what actually happens is different than what we learn in separations. Now, theory is still important and still useful. So here's a, a little quiz, see if, see if any of you can answer it. So here's the question. You have a mixture of water and butanol, Water's boiling point is 100 C, but butanol's is 118 C. So if you, if you send that to a distillation column, what should happen is that you should get water out the top and butanol out the bottom, right? Heavies go out the bottom, water goes out the top. What happens, so you have a 90 mole percent mixture of water and butanol, and out the bottom you get pure water, and out the top you get a mixture of 70 percent water and 30 percent butanol. This kind of stuff happens all the time in real life. So the question is, what is it that makes that happen? And from our discussion in thermodynamics, everybody should be able to answer that question. And three people in particular should be able to answer that question. Uh, this that showing didn't there. show up. Yeah. I'm just going to do it like that. Okay. So here's the, here's the phase diagram for the system. So, uh, and I didn't even need to give you the boiling points uh, because you can get that information from here. This is a PXY diagram, water composition's on the bottom. So it's at a constant temperature. So at a constant temperature, component one has a higher vapor pressure, which means it's more volatile. So if you put it in at 90% water, what you're gonna get out is pure water out the top, or out the bottom, and a mixture out the top, right? Because this point right here represents the lowest temperature in the system. So we can get this from activity coefficient models. So the point is that what we learn in separations is very, very idealized, but that doesn't mean that you can ignore the theory because the theory helps you understand a lot of things that happen. Uh, we just simplify things. So with, uh, with that said, we're going to talk real quick about some of the things that older shock columns can do for you. So first thing that they can do is they can allow you to see inside the column. That, that column that I showed you is a special research column that was built and it has viewports on it. No other column has that. And so, I mean, you, you run your column and you have no idea what's going on inside. You can't see it, you can't look at it. There, there's no way to know. And so, an older shock column can help you understand what type of tray action is taking place. Um, another thing that it can help you do, which is what I spent most of my time doing is determine if the separation is possible. Um, that's the first question. And then if it's possible, it tells you what type of design parameters you're going to need, how many trays you need, what your efficiencies are going to be, what kind of reflux ratio you need, what kind of flow rates your column can handle. Um, and then it can also help you develop a model to, to be used in scale up to predict what's going to happen for experiments. In order to scale up, you need, you absolutely need a good model. And, um, most of the time, the model that you get from the, the parameters that are already in ChemCAD and Aspen isn't going to work. Um, so if you, so one way, you, you have to have good VLE data, which is another experiment that we have here. So um, the experiments that we do here are actually 
important. We ran a VLE experiment for a full year at Salamis collecting data. So uh, it actually is useful. Another thing they can do, like I said, is they can predict tray efficiencies. However, one thing that happens is that um, in an older shot column, you get a lot of extra heat loss that you don't actually have. So you need to be careful in doing scale up because if you think your reflux ratio is two, but you have a lot of heat loss going on, then your internal reflux ratio could be two as well. So your total is four and that is gonna cause problems if you try to scale up based on a reflux ratio of two. Um, I'll just go back to this mode right here. Okay. So another thing that they can do is help you determine the metallurgy that you need to use in your real column. Um, you don't want to build a column that's going to, it's going to be eaten away and fall apart in a few months. Um, these, these columns need to last because they're very expensive. And so what you can do is you can put little pieces of metal on the tray and then run the column to find out what's going to happen to different types of metal at your process conditions. Um, uh, one thing that they're used for all the time is to troubleshoot issues that happen in the plant. Um, if, you're, if you're a process engineer and something's going wrong and you go out to the control room and say, hey, I want to I wanna play around with some, some of my run conditions to see what the problem is, they're going to kick you out of the control room because the operators and the production engineer only care about making stuff that they can sell. And if you start playing with different, um, different conditions in the column, more than likely what comes out is not something that can be sold. And so they're not going to let you play around with it. And so it's much easier just to go into a lab and run it in a, in a column that you can actually see what's going on and that the test can be run very quickly in comparison to a real column. Um, so that is incredibly useful. And another thing that they can do is that they can um, help you with foaming and fouling experiments where um, you can see where if you have a fouling service, where the fouling is going to build up, um, how much is going to happen, so, so that can help you to know where you need to put an inhibitor or, or where you need to change your flow patterns or something like that. So um, that's something that I dealt with a lot was, was foaming and fouling service. And so, um, so that was <laughs> very, very important to me. And then they can help you with your flood testing. That's really important in scale up. Um, this is just a, a quick rundown of what scale up what you typically do for a scale up. Uh, the first step is to run it in an older shot column. If you were to look up instructions for scale up, that's about all it would say for the first step is, is run your system. But that step's not trivial. Just because there isn't a lot of explanation about it like there's, there is the other steps, that, that step is still very difficult. I spent almost the entire time at Celanese trying to figure out what was possible and to get it to run in steady state. Um, then the next thing you do is you collect data at 60% of flood. That's typically, well, so, so you, you, you find your flood point, then you run at 60% of flood, and that's typically just done. Um, some people did some experiments <coughs> several years ago where they discovered that the, the efficiencies that you measure in an older shot column compared to in a real column match the best at 60% of flood, and so that's what they say to do. And then if you have good VLE, then you can use your mixing models. If you don't have good VLE, then you just kind of say, well, this is about the, this is about what I'm getting out of my older shot column, so I'm going to assume that that's what's going to come out of my real column if I run it at the same conditions. Um, so that was all I had. I just wanted to, to explain a little bit of, of what I did and some of the things that you can get out of an older shot column. I think they're really cool. Uh, they're really useful. I had a lot of fun when I was working on them. So, any questions? All right, thank you, Jonathan. <laughs>